Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, Lord, we're um, in the chapter three now of Ruth, and um, it's a beautiful story of Ruth and Boaz, but it's also a story of Christ and the church, and um, we um, we pondered these things already, but just keep us alert to the beautiful sim symbolism of all this that's in this book, and how beautiful it is for us to ponder uh, Christ's love for his bride, the church, um, his love for Israel. And so we ask all these things in, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, again, uh, just a couple uh, reminders of where what the book is and where we are, what we've read already. And then we will, um, um, yeah, we'll get into chapter three. So we think this was composed... Um, uh, somewhere around a thousand to nine, between a thousand and about 950 BC. And it's probably, you know, it's, it's just formally composed. It was probably a story that was already handed on down through the family and so on. Um, it comes from, it, it's set, even though it's writ written after the period of the judges, it's set during the period of the judges. Uh, again, the judges were charismatic leaders that uh, God would um, raise up uh, to, in a moment of crisis. More often than not, they were military leaders, but um, once the crisis was passed, they'd go back to farming or whatever they had been doing. Um, so uh, th there was no king in Israel at that time. There wasn't really a standing army. It, it was kind of a loose confederation of 12 tribes. And um, this judge would come up at a time when there was a crisis and lead, lead Israel for a time and then uh, then decline or and, and, and that. Now, um, we see that um, the theme of the whole book is that of has said or righteousness, right? That uh, and likewise redemption. So uh, Ruth, although not a Jew, uh, marries into a Jewish family, and uh, she shows faithfulness in in wanting after her husband dies to come with Naomi back to the Holy Land, to the Promised Land, and to become. Uh, to, to be there with God's people and to receive the blessings of the land. And as such, she shows faithfulness. Um, and God shows, has said faithfulness by responding to her generosity. And he sets up, shall we say, some coincidences for her. And we'll look at those more in a moment. Um, we heard at the very beginning in chapter one, there was a Limelech and Naomi, who were a couple who had two sons, uh, Mehalan and Chilion. There, there arose a famine in Bethlehem, and so, you know, in a kind of a faithless way, they said, God can't feed us here, and it, literally in a place called the House of Bread, which is what Bethlehem means, so we're going to have to go off to the Moabites, they'll feed us, they'll take care of us, and so this is not a, a good move, all right, for the sense of faithfulness, and also that the Israelites were not to really have any truck, or what do you mean, whatever, you know, relationships with the Moabites who had not assisted them in their journey through the desert. Um, so they go, and sure enough, things go poorly. Both Elimelech his two, and his two sons, all three of them die. Um, and uh, now you have two widows. Um, one, is, one of them is Orpha, the, uh, and then the, uh, she's the wife of Chilion, and then there's Ruth, uh, who was the wife of Malon. And um, she decides, though, to return to uh, to, uh, to the Holy Land, to the Promised Land, with um, with Naomi, who actually tries to tell her not to go back to your gods. She said, and we talked about that. Naomi wanted; to, she was very bitter. She um, she said, "Don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me um, 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 Mara," and which means bitter. Okay, bitter. So um, we um, we see that um, nevertheless, Ruth is makes a decision. That's a good decision. She comes back to the promised land. Now then, in chapter two that we did last week, we saw that again, because of God, um, you know, her faithfulness and her faithful decision, God looks out for her. And she just happens to go and glean in a field. As a very, very poor woman, she had the right at harvest to glean, that is to say, to take some of the grain from the edges of the field. Um, and uh, she just so happens to start working in the uh, in the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz is a man of means because he has money, all right, and um, and, and land. And uh, it just so happens that he is a, a, near, kinswoman, a near kinsman of, uh, of, of Ruth. 
and you know they actually have obligations for her, which will be discovered, and we'll see more of that in this chapter. All right. So Naomi's surprised. Oh, what a coincidence that you ended up in Boaz's field. He's actually near kinsman to us, and frankly, my dear, he may be your ticket to ride. <laughs> And we're going to see how that unfolds here in chapter three. Okay. So we talked a little, there were a number of things that we looked at in, 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 in last week, you know, the, the different forms of grace, the title of that chapter, I would call it amazing grace, that there's a saving grace. Um, there's that there's a sovereign grace that God so arranges it for, uh, for Ruth to end up in the very, that very field. There's a seeking grace that we know that Boaz has his eye on her. He sees her before she sees him. And, um, Let's just say that uh, he thinks that um, she's a, a fine looking young woman and he decides to have his uh, uh, put her under the protection of the other girls uh, on the team and uh, tells the guys don't don't bu don't bug her. He doesn't exactly go and, you know, just go and meet her or ask her out yet. But, you know, you see the idea. Uh, there's a sad, satisfying grace. Um, um, where and again, we see that. Um, and uh, Ruth works very hard to bring in quite a little harvest uh, for her and Naomi. Uh, there's this, and then there, and, and so on. I won't go through the whole thing, but you'll, you'll, you see the idea that ultimately um, um, we, st we ended the chapter last week with, uh, with, Na uh, with Ruth saying to Boaz, if I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, you have given me comfort. You have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. Uh, but she, uh, so again, um, she doesn't fully understand yet that she's a near kinswoman uh, to Boaz and actually does have standing. So now we, that leads us then to chapter three, and let's call chapter three the pursuit of lovers, okay? The pursuit of lovers. Um, we have here, um, if you have your Bibles open to there, would somebody want to read tonight? <clears throat> sure. Um... Would you read uh, verses one and two? Yes. This serves as a kind of a premise. Okay. When Ruth was back with her mother-in-law, Naomi said to her, My daughter, should I not be seeking a pleasing home for you? Now is not Boaz, whose young women you were working with, a relative of ours. This very night he will be winning, <laughs> winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Okay. Now, um, uh, so, uh, should I not try to find a home for you? So she wants to play the role of matchmaker, okay? You know, we, we need we need more of this in our culture today, don't we, right? <laughs> you know, it, it just seems like uh, we're not doing a very good job of pairing them up. Um, and adults used to play more of a role of that in, in, in the lives of their, of their, you know, their younger children. I mean, when I say younger, I mean, you know, they're, they're in their teens and early, very early 20s. But uh, that, there's less of that today. But anyway... Uh, she reminds him um, that um, um, Boaz is a kinsman, has some obligations. Um, he says, tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So, you know, we've got a kind of an image here that maybe a lot of us don't know what that means. In case you don't, uh, the threshing floor is where you, you, uh, you put the grain and then you sort of hit it with a, a kind of a uh, heavy like stick thing and it breaks open the, uh, the wheat from the, from the chaff. And then with the winnowing fan, um, you, you throw it up in the air and, the, and the, 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 the lighter chaff blows this way and the grain falls in the pile. So do you, do you get the procedure? So you basically, you, you, you separate the wheat from the chaff by kind of hitting the wheat. And then you, you pick it up and someone's running and waving a fan and the lighter material goes to the right that you don't want and the grain falls uh, straight down again. And you do that enough that you end up with grain here and chaff there. And that's called a threshing, the threshing of, of, of the wheat on the threshing floor, or the winnowing, I should say, and, and so on, okay? So uh, this, is a, this is kind of the setting. This is kind of the premise. Boaz is a kinsman. She should go there immediately, but she, she should uh, no, take note of her presentation. So um, we'll go ahead and read verses three to five. Okay. Now go bathe and anoint yourself, then put on your best attire and go down to the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man before he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, take note of the place where he lies. Then go uncover a place at his feet and you lie down. He will then tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth replied. 
All right, so Ruth gives her some, shall we say, motherly advice. Um, she says, you know, you should be, you know, just to list the things, you know, be freshly cleansed. Uh, um, we, we also see that she should be fragrantly consecrated. She should be fitly clothed and fully committed and fully compliant or faithfully compliant. So let's look at each of these things. Uh, first of all, to be freshly cleansed. All right. Uh, he says to her wash or she says she says to her wash. All right. Um, so it goes wash and perfume yourself the text says so wash now again think of the think of this as ruth is now as, as an image for the church and the first way that we get into the church if you will or become a member of the bride of christ is that uh, we wash uh we have baptism right um and we need that purification that washing to be uh, be presented to to uh the, the great bridegroom of the church who is christ so I, I have a lot of text here I could share with you. I'm not going to share them all, but <clears throat> but here's just a few things of a cleansing or washing text, you know. So from the book of James, come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded, you backsliders, right? Or um, it says here, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, since we have these promises, dear friend, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body. And, uh, and become perfect in holiness. Um, and so, so again, uh, I don't know, let's see. Um, yeah, there's some others I could give you, but um, there's something said here of Christ in the church in Ephesians 5. It says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to, for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water uh, through the word, okay? So all of these are ways of saying that we are cleansed. We need to be cleansed. And we're cleansed in different ways, you know, in by, first of all, by baptism, of course. That's the first way, right? Um, so, for example, in Acts 22, when Paul has some eager converts, he says to them, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on the Lord's name. Um, we're also, though, purified, not just by baptism, but uh, by the blood of Jesus, right? So... Um, the, uh, it says here that the, the, the blood of Jesus, this is 1 John 1 verse 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. Um, it says here again that um, the blood of, in Hebrews chapter 9, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself as the unblemished land, lamb, will now cleanse our consciousness from acts that led to death so that we might serve the living God. So we're cleansed by baptism and by the blood of Christ. We're also cleansed by repentance. Uh, blind Pharisee said Jesus to them one day, you know, first cleanse the inside of the cup so that also the outside will be made clean. Okay, so the idea of repenting. Uh, 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So in, in, if you will, when the great bride goes to meet uh, the, the great bridegroom, uh, the church, uh, which is symbolically the whole, all of us, but also each of us as individuals, we need to wash, we need to be purified, all right? Um, and so we're also purified by almsgiving. Um, it says, um, you know, it, it says, uh, give alms and everything will be made clean for you. Not that we can buy by holiness, but you get the idea that there's something about giving alms that's a cleansing thing for us. And then but we're, we're also cleansed by faith, by faith. So when Jesus saw the lepers, um, he said, go show yourself to the priest. And one of them, realizing he had been cleansed, uh, ran back to Jesus, uh, giving thanks. And Jesus said to him, go your way. It is your faith that has cleansed you or made you well. Okay. So the first advice is to be freshly cleansed, all right? So when we, when we want to go to meet Christ, um, the great Boaz of the church, um, first, number one, wash, be freshly cleansed. Uh, number two, um, we want to be, uh, you know, we, we should be, uh, the, the church should be fragrantly consecrated. So uh, Naomi says to Ruth, perfume yourself. So wash and then perfume yourself, all right? Um, again, here too, <clears throat> to be fragrantly consecrated now most of you are familiar we use some oils when we do baptism and one of them is the oil of chrism and if you've never smelled chrism it's a beautiful perfumed oil made out of balsam it's olive oil but mixed in with it is a lot of perfume and um everybody can smell that when when it comes out and you 
you you put it over the head of the baby um, uh, and um, you do that and you start to see that the um, um, the the chrism the the fragrant consecration um, of this oil because fills the whole you know everyone smells it now <laughs> my nose went away about ten years ago I don't anymore it's one it's one thing I actually miss I miss that very much the smell of chrism now uh, but just a few things some scriptures here okay to talk about being fra perfumed or fragrantly consecrated the, with the key word there um, it's not it's not just smell good I mean it means be fragrantly consecrated it's what it represents okay so it says you are a garden lock this is from song of songs uh chapter four you are a garden locked up my sister my bride you are a spring and clothe a sealed fountain your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits with henna and nard and saffron and calamus and cinnamon with every type of incense tree with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices now, quoting from the Song of Songs is also good here because Song of Songs has the same basic premise that the bride is the church and the groom uh, in Song of Songs is Christ, okay? So, in other words, you know, be nice to come near. Uh, come, come with an aroma, with the fragrance that we're called to is, of course, the aroma of a holy life, see, of a holy life. So here in 2 Corinthians, we read this. Uh, for we are to God the aroma of Christ, those who are being saved, and uh, those who are being saved. Um, let's see. Here is what uh, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. Okay? So, again, um, the idea to, you know, the, the Pope said recently, it's kind of a ignoble, but it made sense, uh, that the priest should have the smell of the sheep. All right. Well, really, that's a, that's cute. But the sheep, <laughs> us, are to have the, the the fragrance of Christ, right? And so, um, the, the was that that fragrant consecration. Okay. So wash, and that is to say, be freshly cleansed. Number two, be fragrantly consecrated. That is to say, perfume yourself. Okay. Number three would be put on your best clothes. That's what she tells her. So um, um, here too, the idea of being clothed, this is a very powerful image in the New Testament of righteousness, right? that we are to be clothed in the righteousness that God gives us. Um, we are provided, if you will, a garment of righteousness that Christ expects us to wear. Now in your baptism, uh, the priest takes note of the white garments that you wear at baptism and says, see in this outward white garment, this clothing, the sign of your Christian dignity with your parents and godparents to help you bring this dignity unstained to the great judgment seat of Christ. So it's a sign of our dignity. It's a sign of his righteousness in which he clothes us. Here's a couple of scriptures about that. Um, uh, Revelation 19, let us rejoice and exult and give God the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted to her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. And this fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Okay, so to be clothed in this righteousness that God gives. Or from Isaiah chapter 61, uh, Israel, the bride, cries out and she says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in God for he's clothed me with the garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. And as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, so the bride adorns herself with her jewels. And so this beautiful marriage image of, of, of uh, Ruth now going uh, to, to Boaz, to her future husband, um, washed, if you will, uh, freshly washed, um, uh, fragrantly consecrated, and uh, now um, uh, you know, fitly, fitly clothed, but also fully committed. Because here we come to a place, and a lot of people... Um, uh, well, well, we'll we'll talk more about it. And, but a lot of people take this uh, passage as a lurid passage, and it's not. All right. But it says, then she says, be fully committed. That's to say, go down then to the threshing floor. Well, don't let him know that you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. Okay. And when he lies down, note the place where he's lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. It, now, see, the, the problem is that some people interpret this as uh, a sign of sexual intercourse, and it's not. Um, 
there was an unveiling that was spoken of in the marriage ceremony. And in fact, the book, the, the last book of the Bible is named for it, the book of the Apocalypse. Apocalypse in Greek means an unveiling. And it was actually part of a wedding ceremony so that weddings would go on for several days and, and um, the, the groom would arrive at the house of the bride and then take her to his house and there'd be feasting and partying for a day. Then there'd be the marriage ceremony. And then the next day, um, the bride and groom would get alone somewhere and uh, she would, uh, in, you know, take off her veil, so to speak, and more than that, you know, in other words, that's when they had, uh, they consummated the marriage, okay, so the book of the, you know, we hear the word apocalypse, we think of violence and terrible things, but apocalypse is a marriage image, it's a marriage word, it means the unveiling that takes place between a husband and his wife um, for that first time after getting married, okay, and so, um, but it, it, it says uncover his feet, not, un, not uncover his body. You see the idea? And you want to be careful here. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, this was um, kind of a, well, let's, let's talk about what it means. So in other words, Ruth, place yourself at the feet of your redeemer, Boaz. Now, you know, we hear the word redeemer. We think only in religious terms, um, Jesus is our redeemer. Literally to redeem means to buy somebody back either buy them out of poverty or buy them out of debt. You pay something to uh, receive them, okay? Um, so Ruth, place yourself at the feet of your redeemer. He's the one that can get you out of poverty and give you children and give you a future, okay? Um, so this gesture of hers then therefore says this, that I put myself under your protection. I am fully committed to you. In a way, it's a, it's a little bit like a wedding proposal. And a lot of people say, oh, a woman should never propose to a man. Uh, um, but I got news for you. Ruth was desperate. You know? um, not, I don't mean desperate like, you know, but I mean, really, you know, she was in great poverty. So, you know, sometimes throw away rules like that here when you're uh, in that kind of a condition. So, you know, simply to put simply, let's put it this way, that the most sacred place on earth is at the feet of Jesus Christ. Right. And isn't that where we gather, you know, when we come to church and we've got the crucifix and we're all gathered beneath the feet of Christ, you know, and the tabernacle, of course, is there as well. But there's just a powerful image there of being under the protection, under the feet of Christ. And um, uh, it's a sign of uh, fidelity. It's a sign of, uh, uh, you know, being fully committed. OK, so this uncovering of the feet uh, is not a uh, is not to say that they did something inappropriate that night, okay? Monsignor? Uh-huh. Can I just ask one question on that, like, mm -hmm. what did Jesus? In, in deliverance ministries, often you'll hear, you know, certain commands just in the name of Jesus, where it's then they'll send whatever to the foot of the cross, the foot of Jesus. So yeah. it's a mm -hmm. place of redemption, but it's also a place of... Yeah, there's other images in scripture when Christ has put all of his enemies under his feet. You know, and so on. Yes, right. But we we uh, in, would interpret it here. You know, something can have different meanings, right? And so the the idea here is the um, uh, the, the the point that is um, to, you know to be to be under Christ's protection. Okay, if that helps. But you're right. It is also used in the negative sense. Yes, well, good it is. for us, but <laughs> negative for yeah, <laughs> darkness. Right, 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 right. Yep, exactly. So not only then is she to be um, fr uh, fr freshly cleansed, washed in other words, and fragrantly consecrated, hmm? not only is she to be fitly clothed and fully committed, she's to be faithfully compliant. It simply says here, he will tell you what to do. And Ruth answers, uh, Naomi in this case, I will do whatever you say, uh, Ruth answered. All right, so uh, that's, the, um, that's, that's the situation. I'm not sure where my phone is ringing here. All right. Um, now, again, Ruth was not just a hearer of the word, but only, but a doer. Okay, so we hear that Jesus says to us in seven, Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Yeah. And so, um, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when not do what I tell you, says Jesus in Luke's gospel. You see. So again, he will tell you, Boaz is an image for Christ. Ruth is a symbol or image for the church, and the church should go place yourself at the feet of Christ, be fully compliant and committed to him, and, and faithful, you know, faithfully compliant, 
uh, and uh, do, and as, as Mary said regarding Jesus, do whatever he tells you. Okay? And so that's what we have now so far with this chapter, uh, which, uh, you know, that's a lot right there in just those first five verses, right? <laughs> okay, let's continue on, all right? Um, so how about chapters, I mean, verses six through nine, okay? Okay. She went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. Boaz ate and drank to his heart's content and went down to lie, uh, went to lie down at the edge of the pile of grain. She crept up, uncovered her place at his feet, and lay down. Midway through the night, the man gave a start and groped about, only to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. She replied, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the wing of your cloak over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so basically there's not a lot more to come on here. She just does exactly what she was told to do. But um, he, of course, does, <laughs> he's a little startled uh, <laughs> to find a woman lying at his feet. Uh, now, let's be honest. I, I don't think this is, you know, this isn't, you know, illicit sexual union, but it is bold, you know, for a woman to go to the area where the men were sleeping, uh, uncover his feet, and, and then, you know, kind of crawl up next to him is pretty bold. <laughs> And he's surprised. Um, but she says this in, in an act of modesty. She says, um, um, put the corner of your cloak. Let's see here. Um, how does it put there? Um, well, a night something. Okay, start a little bit. Who are you? Oh, uh, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. So again, there is this, again, this put, be put, I, I need to be put under your protection. Uh, you're, you're a kinsman redeemer. We're actually related. Um, I don't know if she's going to say, I saw you looking at me the other day. <laughs> I knew what you were thinking. Dave, if you got the curves, I've got the angles. No. <laughs> no, I'm being silly. But, you know, the uh, the idea being that um, um, she, she may have already known that he had some affection for him and so on. But at the end of the day, this is this is modest. This is not some immodest thing. Could take the corner of your cloak and... Um, uh, cover me for uh, I am your uh, you're a near kinsman redeemer. All right. Now uh, you may remember I, I don't want to say they're directly related, but there's another image of, of another woman who said if I could just touch the corner of the clo uh, the the uh, the fringe of his garment, I'll get well. You see, and so this too is a beautiful image of the healing and redemption that Christ can effect for us. Okay. So again, always remember Boaz is Christ and Ruth is the church. All right. Now uh, comes the payoff. Um, in uh, verse, just read verse 10 and 11. He said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have been even more loyal now than before in not going out after the young men, whether poor or rich. Now rest assured, my daughter, I will do for you whatever you say. All my townspeople know you to be a worthy woman. Okay, and um, again, he said, uh, therefore, uh, he emphasizes her worthiness, her chastity. He is uh, well aware of, um, of her. And he's, he says, uh, in effect, um, I'm glad you didn't run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. Um, um, you know, Boaz is a little bit older, he, you know, and, um, and so on. But she, um, uh, you know, he's very, he's very, you know, obviously he's excited and happy. He noticed her before and thought that she was, uh, you know, so he, someone uh, who was beautiful and wanted to know her um, and put her under the protection uh, you know, of, of, of the other workers. So, What's interesting, though, is he addresses her as my daughter. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, it is interesting. It's a, a as, as far as my own studies go, this is just kind of a Jewish way of speaking. Um, for example, um, and, and not just Jewish, but um, a lot of languages. I know, I know that um, you, um, um, you know, I, I guess um, when it, um, what's the word I'm, anyway, if you remember from Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, he often called her, uh, Juan Diego called our Blessed Mother, I think like my little one, my little mother, or my little one. And uh, is that, Joy, do you remember? Yeah, I'm not sure about Our Lady of Guadalupe, but some Spanish dialects, albeit not the ones that I speak, um, but they will like husbands and wives, or husbands particularly with their wives, and call them like Mika would be, which would be equivalent of like my daughter, but it's mm -hmm. not like with that meaning. So I'm familiar yeah. with that. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a sign of affection. Mm -hmm. 
like yeah. uh, again, when when in English, the use of the diminutive, with, with some exceptions like Charlie, or uh, but you wouldn't go up to somebody and say uh, whose name was um, um, Bill. But I don't know. I'm trying to think of a name that just doesn't, you know. Again, people find that kind of humiliating. But in in, in many languages, the use of the diminutive is meant as a sign of affection, uh, of love. It's not meant, like you say, Joy, as a, literally my daughter. Why would a husband call his wife my daughter? Um, but rather just my little one, the one I love, you know. But again, it doesn't work for us in English, but it does for them. And that's true in Hebrew as well, okay? Good. So Bo Boaz now blesses her and commends her choice. Um, there were other more handsome and younger men, but Ruth has made her choice. Um, now for us, the world may seem, uh, so what we wanna see here is maybe, we have a choice to make for Christ. And for some of us, the world may seem more attractive, especially when Christ speaks of the cross as the way, uh, yet the Lord commends our choice and he gives blessings when we're faithful. Um, but too many people see the world as more attractive, um, more youthful, more invigorating, more exciting, um, and would rather have the world than Christ, see? But to those who choose him, Christ says, good, good choice. <laughs> you didn't run after the, the others, you, you, you come to me and uh, I'm prepared to bless you, okay? So uh, do, you, do you see here um, the, uh, what's going on? Any other questions about this? So, you know, we've seen so far, just, you know, to keep kind of the big picture in mind, the premise that Naomi knows that Boaz is a near kinsman and sends Ruth off to say, somehow bump into him, okay? And uh, so he, he said, but before you do that, make a good presentation, you know, it says wash, perfume yourself, put on your best clothes and so on, okay? Likewise, um, you know, that uh, she should uh, then, um, you know, the, the, um, the next, if you will, phase of it comes the payoff, all right? And now we go to the purification, some further purification that seem to be necessary. So how about 12 through 15? Now I am in fact a redeemer, but there is another redeemer closer than I. Stay where you are for tonight and tomorrow if he will act as redeemer for you, good. But if he will not, as the Lord lives, I will do it myself. Lie there until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but rose before anyone could recognize another. For Boaz had said, let it not be known that this woman came to the threshing floor. Then he said to her, take off the shawl you are wearing, hold it firmly. When she did so, he poured out six measures of barley and helped her lift the bundle. Then he himself left for the town. All right. Now, oopsie, <laughs> there's another nearer kinsman nearer than him. And technically he has first rights. Uh, Boaz has to go, if you will, and secure his permission uh, to, to be in this role because it looks like somehow Boaz, look, look let's be honest, guys and, and gals. Uh, I mean, he saw her. He, he, we know he was trying to, say, who is this? You know, tell me more about her. Huh? Yeah. And he's been kind of doing some research, hasn't he, right? Because he knows that there's another nearer kinsman than him to Ruth who has the first, not just obligation, but opportunity. And so he says, you know, I've got to go uh, and see if he wants to redeem. Um, but if not, uh, you know, uh, you know um, uh, I, I need to go talk with him and, and work this out. So all of a sudden we're like, uh oh, what will happen? What will happen? Uh, so we've got some rising action here, uh, a moment of tension in the, uh, in, in the um, uh, episode here. Now, um, um, well, I, I, before I uh, talk more about the overall meaning of this, he also tells her again, if he is not willing, namely, um, if he doesn't want to redeem you, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. So stay here till morning, and she did. And then again, he gives her a kind of, um, uh, what I would call, I sometimes call these things signal graces, where the Lord sort of signals you. I, I know that um, you're kind of waiting me to do some big things in your life, but... Um, let me just give you some signal graces that, you know, I'm on the job. I'm on the job. And those are what we sometimes call signal graces, right? God is signaling us. Don't forget, I'm still in the blessing business, all right? Now, um, so he pours out the, uh, the, uh, the um, grain and so on. Now, 
And this is complicated to work out in times of type typology because Boaz has a competitor who has first claim on Ruth. But I mean, who's the competitor of the Lord Jesus? No one's competitor to him. Surely not the devil. But truth be told, the Lord respects our heart and he has to win it away from other lovers. Pay attention to that line. The Lord respects our freedom and he has to win our heart away from other lovers, you know? You know, if, you, if I say to you, who do you love the most? Oh, of course I love God the most. That's the required answer, but is it the honest answer? And God knows that one of his biggest works is to work in our heart, to get our hearts, you know, away from these toys and trinkets and, the, and the, our loyalty to the world and everything in it and, and to turn our hearts to him. And, and um, this is a hard, hard work. And um, so uh, that's what I think you should see in this part of the story, that Boaz has to kind of go and negotiate um, and, um, and so on. So um, we love the world. We love popularity. We love ourselves. You know, we must truly, cons the, the Lord must truly consult with our heart and purify it of all other lovers, right? You've, you've heard some of these lines, but no one can serve two masters. Either he'll love the one and hate the other, but you cannot serve God and, and, and the world or God and money. Um, Luke 14, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers, sisters, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. Now, hopefully we don't need to go through this again, but the word hate doesn't mean despise. It's just, again, um, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a Jewish expression that says you have to love me most and first. Right? And then again, we've seen this one before, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Okay? So this um, other near kinsman redeemer who has first dibs, so to speak, pardon me for putting it that way, but you get the idea. Um, how could it, how could anyone have first dibs before Jesus? Well, because unfortunately that's how we are. So, although Ruth symbolizes the church, you know, we have to allow this, this interruption because, uh, there are other suitors and some of us are more than willing to run after other suitors than, uh, than the Lord Jesus. Okay. All right. Um, we now come to toward the end of the chapter here. Um, there comes the pursuit um Honestly, so um mm -hmm, go ahead real quick that last verse 14 okay. where he says not, not be now the woman came to the threshing floor uh, you said 14 yeah. i'm sorry i don't quite understand the question where anyone don't let it be that a woman could come to the threshing floor <laughs> yes, yes, like I told yes, you, it's a secretive. Well, it was bold, <laughs> uh, but he he acknowledges her chastity, um, and so on. But not everybody would, right? Um, you know, uh, she she went there under instructions. Uh, she did exactly as she was told. But again, not everybody would look at that and say, "Well, now that's a faithful woman." Uh, like, What's she doing there? Uh huh. Look, what kind of a woman is this? So he wants to protect her honor. So I'm glad you raised that. I mean, I think that's important, right? Right. Boaz accepts her her offer, honors her 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 chastity, um, but not he realizes not all others would understand or honor her. Okay. Good. Thanks for asking. All right. Now going then to verse 16 to the end of the chapter. She, meanwhile, went to her mother-in-law, who asked, How did things go, my daughter? So she told her all the man had done her for her, and concluded, He gave me these six measures of barley, and said, Do not go back to your mother-in-law empty. Naomi then said, Wait here, my daughter, until you learn what happens, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Okay, so Boaz is going out to fight for her. <laughs> And she's excited because, uh, and Naomi's actually very confident. You know how she was so depressed and unconfident before, but now she's very confident of the outcome. And uh, he says, he's going, to, he's going now to find out. He will not rest until the matter is settled today. And uh, so again, uh, Naomi uh, has great, great confidence at this moment. And um, we'll have to wait till next time to see how it all goes. 
<laughs> now we're not completely done here, but but uh, the um, there's um, God also pursues us um, and will not rest until the matter is over, so to speak, until our our no were to become final. Now I'll just read you a little bit from the Song of Songs again, which has a very similar theme, where you've got um, a, a young bridegroom and his bride to be, and um, we we see here. Um, this is the church speaking now. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. It's a lily among brambles. So is my love among the maidens. As an apple tree among the trees of wood, so is my beloved uh, among the young men. And with great delight, I sat in his shadow and uh, his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought, he brought to me to the banqueting house and, uh, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, says the bride, for I am sick with love. Oh, that his left hand were under my head and his right hand embraced me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you would stir up nor awaken love until it please. Um, the voice of my beloved, behold, now he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag, for there he stands behind the wall, gazing through the window, looking in through the lattice. And my beloved says, uh, speaks to me and says, arise, my, my, my beloved, my fair one, my beautiful one, and come away. Now, again, we'll leave it at that, but I often have this image in mind, and sometimes when I'm giving retreats and this comes to Eucharistic adoration, I often use this, you know, behold, uh, the church says, my lover comes, leaping the mountains and bounding over the hills, and he comes and it says he, he looks in through the window. And isn't that what the Lord is doing there in adoration? He's looking through the window at his beloved church. See, it's a beautiful romantic image in a way of, of Christ uh, and his love for the church. And just as this young man looks through the window uh, of the garden to see his beloved, likewise, uh, the Lord looks through the window at adoration to see us. And uh, think, wow, Father, I never thought about that. <laughs> but you get the idea. So, um, yeah, um, I've, I've taught the Song of Songs before, and, and some people struggle with it because it is very <laughs> sort of descriptive in places and, and, and so on. But it's a beautiful allegory of, uh, of love, of love between Christ and his bride. And, um, you know, sometimes we get, we, we get so, uh, what's the word I'm looking at, so geeky. We get so intellectual and analytical about things that we forget that love, uh, love, has can say and understand things that words can't and the idea that god god really does really does love us he loves his church as his bride and um you know every now and again somebody says to me i don't i don't i think jesus is okay but i can't stand the church and so, so i say well let me give you an analogy to see how, how does it because you can you really have christ without the church no can do for two reasons first of all on the one hand is his body on the other hand, it's his bride. We say, well, which one is it, Father? Well, have you not read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two of them shall become one flesh? So the church is both bride and body. Now, let's say that you go to a, if I go, I were to go to a friend and say, man, I think you're a really cool dude. I think you're just, you're great, man. Uh, I just can't stand your wife. They'll get her out of here. She's, she, she's terrible. She's ugly. She's a bee. You know, how would my friend react? You see, and yet some people talk like that. They say, well, I like Christ, but I don't like the church, you know, or again, hey, you know, someone were to come to you and say, yeah, no, I really think you're a swell person, but boy, do you have an ugly body. Your body is so ugly. I can hardly stand to be around you, you know, I mean, that, that would be insulting, you know, and um, so all these are just ways of saying that uh, Christ and his bride, Christ his bo and his body, it's all together. It's one. And you, can, you, know, you, you they, if you think you can have Christ without the church, no can do. No can do. You know, love me, love my body. Love me, love my bride. See? Okay. Qui me amat, amat uxorum meum. Love me, love my wife. <laughs> so, all right. See, I can even say it in Latin. <laughs> all right. Now, we're, we're going to have to see how the story unfolds. You know, I mean, you you may have already read ahead or you, you know it's going to have a good ending, but the two of them will, will marry. But there is some high drama that comes as he negotiates with, uh, 
with this other more closer, nearer kinsman, okay? Um, but it goes well. Now, the, here's the problem. I'm going to be away next Monday, okay? So we'll have to skip a week. You know, it's kind of a frustrating when you're, we've gone three, three chapters through uh, a four chapter book. <laughs> I have to have a break right there at the end. But um, the following Monday, what would that be? The um, seventh, the 14th, I think. So it's the seventh that I'll be away. I think if I got my dates right. Um, okay. Maybe it's better that we do not meet on December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. Some of you have to be a little older, maybe, to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Pearl Harbor. Yes. Oh <laughs> well, oh, you must have studied history or something. <laughs> well, I apparently wasn't around then, but. Okay. Yeah, no, I know, and neither was I. <laughs> that was like, you know, 20, 20 years before I was born. But, you know, it's funny how we, things that we used to take for granted that everybody knew. I find out a lot of times today people don't know. I'll quote a song and I think, well, man, we used to dance to that song. And, you know, other people are giving me a blank stare like they've never heard it before. That's why I'm, I'm just kind of playing with you a little bit. <laughs> okay. Good, good, good. All right. Well, I hope you see that. I really think this is a beautiful story. It's the story of love, um, even daring love. It's the story of, um, of the, we, we call this chapter today, The Pursuit of Lovers. She pursues him, he pursues her. And um, we'll see it kind of come to a culmination uh, in, in the last chapter. But at the end of the day, um, I think that's um, where we should end today. Um, also, I think um, I will, um, you know, Joy, if you want to send the recordings of the first two chapters, and I'll, I'll have this one up. Um, maybe if you want to wait a day, I'll have this one up by, before I leave tomorrow. Okay. So I can just send the three of them all at once then. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Joy, do you have my email? Um, so it comes out on the flock note. So oh, okay. the same distribution list, you'll get it. If you get these emails, you'll get that one too. Okay. All right. So um, I, 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 love, um, I love these allegories. Um, and both this and the Song of Songs are in some ways a daring allegory. Um, it includes, you know, the idea of romantic love um, and sanctifies it. That's a beautiful thing. It's not something trashy or bad. And of course, we live in a hypersexualized time where we we're very cynical and we we tend to rather quickly think of things um, as uh, as bad. Um, and uh, but it's not that at all. It's not meant to be that. It's meant, but that there is a beauty and a, and a greatness about romantic love too. And yes, it has to come in for a landing. Um, you can't always be up in the clouds soaring. Um, Especially about six minutes after the wedding's over is usually when you gotta come in for a landing. But, uh, uh, but I think there's, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, it, in that, the, uh, as a, an, an analogy or as an allegory, you know, for God's love for us. So, and hopefully our love for God. Okay. Any final comments or questions? You wouldn't recommend that a modern day woman go about this method of pursual? I don't know, why not? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm always telling what, uh, younger women, go, go ask them. Go lay at their feet. Well, I mean, whatever the modern like equivalent of that modern is, you know, that's not in our that. culture. But No, just pull back the covers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but I, I don't mean it in the absolute literal way, uh, Angelica. I, but I mean, you know, go ask them. Why not? Well, because it's sort of not done. Well, why not? Well, just because it isn't. Oh, okay. But you know, maybe just go up to a young man you'd like to meet and say, you know, I'd love to have a cup of coffee with you. Would you, would you, uh, would you join me at the corner coffee place on Saturday? <clears throat> Simple little invitation, you know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm just saying this because uh, a lot of a lot of young men, pardon the expression, are kind of down on the job. I, I don't know why. We we were sort of pressured to be asking girls out when I was growing up, and um, even as a young adult. You know, if we weren't married, we were sort of pressured. You know, you got to be dating somebody. You're not dating somebody. What's going on, man? Um, and uh, a lot of that's kind of gone away. I know there's a lot of reasons and college debt and um, other things. Uh, there's also a lot of um, concern, I think, for what what would we would call it um, unwanted uh, attention that sometimes women push back really hard, um, and and some men are afraid of that. Um, uh, Sexual harassment, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, you know, and 
and so on. So I think there's there's a lot of things in the climate now that are more poisonous, I guess. Um, but anyway, as I have to say, in, in the best of situations, I don't know why um, a young woman can't go to a young man she might be interested in and say, look, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get to, you know, have a cup of coffee, get, get to know you a little bit, you know. Something, you know, you don't have to make a big dinner thing. It would be just say something sim simple. And what do they call it? It's just lunch. There's some kind of a dating thing out there for that. It's just lunch. Somehow lunch is less, you know, trapping than, than going out to dinner. So anyway, but those are just some, that's really what I'm getting at. You know, not nothing lurid or, um, uh, well, un but Ruth did what in her culture made some sense at that time, even though it was daring. But I told you, you know, she's desperate um, to have a redeemer. Um, and so the church has been very daring at times. You know, look at all the martyrs. That's daring. You know, I need a redeemer. Um, and if, if he asked me to die for him, I'll do it. So I mean, that is, it's, it's meant to illustrate the intensity of the desire. Um, it was, it was considered, you know, as we already talked about a little bit unusual that a woman would be in the area where the men were sleeping. Um, that is unusual and it's daring, but he acknowledged that she was chaste. Okay. So, um, all right. Anything else? You know, I, I would say it, it is a worthy topic, you know, to, um, you know, to talk about uh, that so many young women often tell me, you know, that the men aren't even asking them out. And we're not, you know, these, you know, so many very, very attractive. I mean, if I were young, I, not a priest, I'd be asking. But things seem to have changed. And it'd be interesting at some point to have a little forum or something where we discuss why that might be. And it might even be good in, first of all, single sex environments and then come together, you know, as men and women together. Uh, and discuss it, but it's one of those things worth discussing. And um, I don't think uh, we adults, I mean, older adults, we're talking like they're, you know, um, uh, do, do as much as we could to give opportunities and give encouragement, so. All right, well, something to think about. Now, um, the Lord be with you. Your spirit. Thanks, and may almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So I'll see some of you around. I'll certainly see all of you. Uh, um, God willing, the creeks don't rise and the plane don't crash. <laughs> I'll, I'll and the, the metro is going to stop running in the weekends. Yeah, right. Okay, but I'll I'll see you all. Uh, see you all uh, by uh, next Monday. Okay. Safe travels. Not, not this Monday. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I take care. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, now uh, let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we are finishing up tonight this beautiful book of Ruth, and uh, it has kind of a, uh, a fascinating ending, a joyful ending. And uh, we thank you for it, because it's a beautiful image of Christ with the church. Uh, Boaz represents the church, and, and Ruth, I mean, Boaz represents Christ, and, and Ruth represents the church. So help us to Rejoice in the great love that uh, you have for your bride, the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, just a few uh, quick overview things and a reminder of what happened in the first three chapters. We think that this was composed between 1,000 and 950 BC, uh, right around the time of King David. Um, some argue that maybe even Samuel wrote the book. We're not sure. Um, Ruth is a story, it, it, she, it, Ruth is the great grandmother of, of, of King David um, and, and Boaz, the great grandfather. So there's a, a um, I'm sorry, grandfather, I don't mean great grandfather, but grandfather. And um, we see that um, um, its fundamental theme is hesed, um, which is translated into English, faithfulness, that God is faithful. Um, and uh, that we're called to be faithful as well. And Ruth exemplifies a beautiful faithfulness uh, to God. And um, God, re you know, responds, of course, with many rich blessings. It's also a story about redemption. Um, Ruth is very, very poor. She's a, um, a Moabite woman, not, uh, not even a Jewish woman. 
And um, she really is the definition of poor. She's a, a widow without any sons to care for her. And um, so she, and yet God provides for her. And you and I are poor in that we cannot save ourselves. We just don't have enough holiness uh, to, um, to ultimately, you know, gain heaven. And we, we depend on Jesus, if you will, to redeem us. That is to say, to pay the price for us to get uh, out of the, the jail, if you will, of sin and into the glory of heaven. So Ruth represents all of us in this sense, right? So uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's, so it's a sor- story of faithfulness. It's a story of redemption. Um, we, its significance is that, again, it, it, it ties us to King, it's tied to King David, and these are the grandparents of David. Um, and um, although there are a number of characters at the beginning of the book, it really comes down to uh, both Boaz and Ruth and Naomi. These are the three ones that we're mainly working with. Now, for a basic reminder, then, of where we've been, um, let's look, uh, you know, chapter one was a, was a choice that, that um, was made uh, by, um, uh, by the, the father of the family, Elimelech, to instead of trusting God to get them through the famine, he was living in Bethlehem at the time. He took his wife, Naomi, and his two sons, Malon and Chilion over to Moab, where he had heard that there was food in abundance. And in so doing, this was, a, this was not an act of faithfulness. This was not trusting God. This was to go, and I would rather trust a foreign government uh, than, than God to feed me. And he, so he goes over to the Moabites, who, by the way, were enemies of Israel. And, uh, were, and Israelites were told not to interact with them because they had um, uh, been... Um, uh, they had been unkind to them in the egg, uh, when they as they came into the promised land. So he he broke a lot of the norms and rules of what you would call faithfulness, both to uh, the rules, so to speak, but also to the um, um, uh, to uh, trusting in God. All right, and so we talked a little bit about how decision determines destiny, and that he made a, a choice, uh, and, and 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 the problems that emerged from that choice. Uh, and then, uh, but we now then, then the attention turns to Ruth, who makes a wise choice and a choice to, to trust God, the God of Israel. Uh, and she goes back to after both uh, Elimelech and both of his sons die. Ruth, who was married to one of the two sons, decides to go back with Naomi to Israel, even though Naomi tried to say, Go back to your own gods and your own country. Naomi was very depressed and angry. She said, call me Mara because I'm bitter. Um, But nevertheless, Ruth goes and she makes a wise choice. And because of this, uh, God rewards her um, because she just so happens to end up when she comes into the area to be gleaning in a field uh, that, that belongs to a man named Boaz, who she doesn't know, but is a near kinsman and who has obligations to her. And so, you know, you know, they, oh, there's an old saying that coincidences when God chooses to just remain anonymous, you know. Um, but all this is, again, God, how God rewards her. Now, uh, we see in chapter two, which I titled Amazing Grace, how once again, um, while she's gleaning in the field, what does it mean to glean? To glean means to, that, that it was instructed to those, the wealthy who own property, like, and had you know barley harvest or grape harvest or the different harvest that they should not uh, harvest right to the edges of the field, but that they should leave some for the poor and the passerby to glean or to come and, and take the leavings that they have left uh, for for themselves. So Ruth, because she's very poor, is is gleaning in this field of barley, and. Um, uh, it just so happens to belong to Boaz. Now, what's interesting is that Boaz notices her before uh, she notices him. Now, he doesn't immediately approach her, but he notices her. And I don't mean to be too uh, silly, but I mean, he says, you know, she's a fine looking young lady over there, you know, and <laughs> yeah, you can tell that he's, he, 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 he notices her. Let's put it that way. And then he puts, he says to his uh, foreman, Make sure the men do not trouble her. Um, keep her in the care of the other women, and I want her to be protected. 
So he he comes under she comes under Boaz's protection. Um, and and then we begin to see that she goes back and tells Naomi, and Naomi's like, "Wow, he's well, he's a near kinsman of us. Uh, uh, I tell you what, um, we're going to need to um, get you gussied up." So that's chapter three, uh, the pursuit of lovers, where he tells her to gussy up. Uh, get, get, you know, basically, you know, wash, she says, uh, you know, put on a nice dress um, and um, uh, put on your perfume and, and, uh, and go over there. And um, I want you to, uh, in the evening, go and, and uncover his feet and lie at his feet. And um, this was her way of indicating that um, I'm a near kinsman to, or kinswoman to you and you have obligations to me. And um, I'm asking for you know, it, it's not exactly a marriage <laughs> proposal, but it, it, in effect, it has that effect. All right. And uh, so we see that um, this is uh, where it is. Now, Boaz is delighted by this, by her, by her approaching him, just like God is delighted when you come to him to pray. Right. And uh, so we see that um, we have um, a lot of, uh, a lot of this. Now, um, he agrees to, um, to, to again to redeem her so to speak in other words to uh to to marry her and to uh bring her into his household however and here's where there's a twist in the plot uh and we're going to pick up on how that's resolved today it's in verse 12 of chapter 3 it says that boaz says to her although it is true that i am near of kin there is a kinsman near a redeemer nearer than i so stay here for the night and i will go to him in the morning and if he wants to redeem then let him redeem but if not um, as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem. Um, and so uh, stay here until the morning. And so Boaz de determines to go out that morning and to speak to the other near kinsman and in effect uh, convince him that um, um, he, he should allow Boaz to, uh, to, to, to marry um, Ruth. Okay, so that's, the, that's the twist in the plot. Now, before we get into chapter four, I want to ask you a question. I just want to close my door though, just because I, I don't want to disturb a couple of the other priests in the hallway because, because I talk loud. So I, I, I asked you to consider last time and we did talk about this. If it's true that Boaz represents Christ and Ruth represents uh, the church and to some extent you and I, how is it that there is some near other near kin nearer kinsmen than the Lord to us? What's that all about? How could that be? I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, Monsignor, but doesn't it have to do with the fact that we're kind of like we have a tendency to um, desire things that aren't good for us and like we're kind of more like under the dominion of sin first yeah. something like that and that well yeah. then Jesus buys us or not well I don't know I don't know the phrase but he redeems us yes so I think the, 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 the simple fact is that the Lord has to battle uh, against other lovers so to speak and we, we don't maybe like to admit it, but we, uh, we do have other lovers. Uh, in many cases, we love the world. We love things of the world more than we love God. And there, there's a battle that the Lord has to engage in to overcome those other suitors. Uh, 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 and and that's, an, that's what Boaz, in, in going to meet this other near kinsman, says that you have some rights over Ruth. Um, and I need for you to surrender those rights. See, so the Lord goes to battle for our soul um, and tries to free us from these other lovers, if you pardon the expression. Does not, though, St. James in his epistle say, you know, um, you know, he speaks of lovers of the world as adulterers, right? Adulterers. That's what he calls lovers of the world, namely, if we're not careful, us. All right. OK, so, yeah, I wanted to make that point. And so as, as chapter three ends, Boaz is going to get up in the morning and go speak to this other near kinsman and try to resolve the matter so that there's nothing between him and Ruth or no one between him and Ruth. Now, there's an old gospel song. I don't know if anyone here in the parish has ever heard it, but it says there's nothing between my soul and the Savior, nothing between. 
You can look it up on YouTube and hear it. There's nothing between my soul and the Savior. There's nothing between. Now, <clears throat> we hope. Because <laughs> if we're not careful, there's a lot of things between our soul and the Savior. You know, some of these songs we sing with hope, don't we, right? right? Okay. All right. Well, listen, I see a few of you are a little tired this evening, but let's continue on. We're going to go into this high drama now. Um, and um, would somebody like to read um, or should I? Love to hear your voice. Go ahead. All right. Now, what I want to do is break this chapter into um, into four um I mean, into, into three different um, pictures of uh, salvation. I want to look at a, a, a redeeming Lord. Uh, I want to look at a renewed life and a restored legacy. So these are pictures of salvation, three pictures of salvation. So the first thing is, by the way, redemption literally means to buy back. Now, what happens is it's usually used in reference to a family member who has debts that they can't pay. And so they're thrown into debtor's prison or they're enslaved. And so part of the job is hopefully there's a, a wealthy family member called a Goel who can go and pay the price or pay off the debts, in other words, of this person and get them out of slavery or out of debtor's jail, okay? And that's what's literally meant by redemption. So Christ, if you will, bought us out of the prison of slavery, he paid our bill, so to speak, um, that we could never hope, we could never hope to pay. Um, he paid it all, um, as, as the old song says, Jesus paid it all. Now, with that picture in mind, let's, let's begin. I'm in chapter four, and we're in verse one. And I'm going to read the first, so I say six verses. And the picture here is of a redeeming Lord. Remember, Boaz represents Christ. So meanwhile, then Boaz went up to the town gate, and he sat there. And when the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and he sat down. Now Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, you all sit here. And so they did. So you see, he's gathering now, not just, this is a legal action that he's engaging in because he has witnesses. So verse three, then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to her brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. But if you will not buy it back, if you will not redeem it, um, if, if you will redeem it, do so. But if not, please tell me so that I know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am then next in line. And I will redeem it if, if, if he said. In other words, if this other near, near kinsman doesn't. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy, uh, then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, you also though must acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. And th at this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Okay. Now, um, you'll notice again, what Naomi, with the only money Naomi had at all was a small piece of property that she was prepared to sell. But it, look, we're so different today. We don't, we think of real estate or property as just a product. Uh, you know, you just buy and sell a house, you know. Some of us kind of have maybe some fond memories of a, house, of a family home somewhere. But at the end of the day, <laughs> You know, we wouldn't think twice about selling it usually um, if we wanted to. That is unthinkable in ancient Israel. Because remember, this is the promised land. And God gave this land to our people. And as the people entered that land, different tribes settled in different areas. And then different members of each of those tribes received that land from God. And you don't just buy and sell land like a commodity um, unless you're utterly desperate. So the idea is that you always try to keep the land in the property. That's why the near kinsman redeemer is the first one that Boaz must go to and say, if you don't want to buy the land, um, then I will. But you are first in line and you have right of first refusal. However, 
you are um, also required then to acquire his 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 uh, his widow um, and and marry her, so that she too can stay with the land. And he says, "Well, I can't. I can't." Now he sort of puts it that I can't afford uh, another wife, but in effect, he's also saying, "I, I I'm I'm already married." Okay. Now note that. Um, a couple of details about this passage we just read. Note three things are necessary for a person to be a kinsman redeemer. He had to be a near kinsman. He had to be a close relative, in other words, we would say. He had to have the money and he had to be willing. Okay. So then note the terms of our salvation. Christ, and only Christ could meet all three of these. Only Jesus. First of all, he had to be a near kinsman. That's why he came and joined our family. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. I would be, but, <laughs> but he's not. He's not. Uh, uh, you know, he joins our family, if you will, to have something to do with our case, you see? So he becomes a near kinsman to us. Uh, I think I told you this before. I have a brother who's a FedEx pilot. Um, I have another brother. He flies all over the world. I have another brother who's so, he's a former financial analyst who's so smart he retired when he was 50. And uh, I have another brother who happens to be God, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> so, you see, he's in the family, right? And I'm in his family. So there's a, Jesus joins our family. He becomes to us a near kinsman, okay? He had to have the money. Now, in other words, none of us can pay the price of our redemption, y'all. Are, are you praying with me? You remember the story of the man, the 10,000 man had owed a debt of 10,000 talents? Do you have any idea what 10,000 talents is like? I mean, we're talking, you know, seven, seven or eight figures. We're talking, you know, into the billions, all right? This is not something you're going to work a little overtime and pay off. In other words, he has a debt he cannot pay, and that's us. Only the Lord can pay this debt. And so Jesus comes, and as we say, he paid it all. He redeemed us by his blood, okay? So... He, he, Jesus is a near kinsman, he has the money, and he's willing. There's a beautiful thing when he gets up at the Last Supper and goes out to be crucified. We know that within hours he'll be arrested in the garden. He gets up from the Last Supper, and he says, Arise thou, let us go forth. The world must know that I love the Father. So Jesus is willing to go and pay this price for our redemption because he loves his Father and he loves us. All right? So, Jesus meets all these criteria. The one particular one that no one could meet except him was the middle one there. He had to have the money, had to have the ability, the power, the capacity, all right? And he has that as God. All right, some other particulars. Who is our nearer kinsman? We already, I already introduced this to you. Yes, yes, yes. You know, everyone says to you, uh, who do you love most? Oh, I love God the most, you know? That's the, that's the expected answer, but the honest answer, you know, the honest answer is not always true, see. You know, we can love popularity, money, sex, power, or a particular person can have more authority in our life than God does. And they may not be an evil person, but they, but they, they have, if anybody can talk you out of following God's law in any way, they have too much power. I mean, the boss, or a spouse that says, no, 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 I don't want to go to church and uh, I'm going to start making life difficult for you if you do and say, okay, well, I'll stop going to church. That, that spouse has too much power. Or if a boss can get you to do something either illegal or immoral, he has too much power. See, so who are some of the suitors? Who does Jesus have to go out to the gate and talk to? The gate of your heart, your heart. He goes out, you know, so Boaz here goes outside the city gates. And he has to negotiate. He says, you know, honest truth is you have first dibs. Who is that in your life? Or what is that in your life? That Jesus has to go outside the gate of your heart and do the negotiations and begin to pry away that thing or that person, you see? So who are our, who are our other suitors, you know? Um, uh, who are those that... Um, would get in the way or be first in line between us and Jesus, you see? And that those are, that's just an honest question for you to have with the Lord in prayer. I'm not asking anyone to answer it out loud. Father, I love booze more than Jesus. You know, I'm not asking for any, I'm not asking for any 
confessions out loud here. Or Father, I, I, I've got a um, uh, a boyfriend, and he, you know, we we do things we shouldn't, but I don't want to lose him. So I love I love him more than Jesus. You know, you see the idea. These are the things that we struggle with. You know, I, I'm just giving you two quick examples. Would you follow me, right? Uh, and look, I got to climb the company ladder. And I know I got to cook the books a little. I know that our product is dangerous, but I can't bring that up because, you know, I might lose my job. See, and so I, I love my job and my money. And I'm, I'm more worried about my boss than you, Jesus. So Jesus has to go outside the gates of our hearts, so to speak, and begin to push back these other suitors, these other suitors. Okay. Um, so uh, again, you know, who, who are those other nearer kinsmen in our life? All right. You decide, you decide. And look, this is a human struggle. All right. This is a human struggle. It isn't something that, you know, you're just going to do a little bit of, um, you know, meditating and then they're gone. It, it's a lifelong struggle in some sense. And it's a human struggle. All right. And the Lord is very merciful to us. He knows we're very weak and that our hearts are very indecisive. He says you can't serve God and mammon, but we spend most of our life trying. We really do. You know, we want we want both. And it just drives us crazy. It is the source of most of the conflict in our life. Okay. So any comments or questions about that um, before I, uh, you know, for example, let me ask you a question if you don't have one for me. What would you think, um, um, what, about, what are these 10 witnesses? I mean, let's, I don't I mean who are they historically, but what do you think these 10 witnesses might represent that the Lord calls? Well, what's another thing that's got 10 in the Bible? Maybe, maybe give you a hint. What was that? The commandments. Yeah. So in a certain sense, we can almost see that as he goes outside the gates of our heart to negotiate against other suitors, that in some way, those suitors somehow draw us into violating the Ten Commandments and somehow turning something that's not God into something that is like a God to us or more important than God, right? So that we have other gods before him or that uh, we don't want to worship and praise him or really love him. We love other things more. I'd rather play tennis than worship God on Sunday morning. Um, or again, that, um, you know, that um, I'm not willing to uh, live in a relationship of honor with my parents and my elders and be taught. I could go on and on with all the commandments, right? But I treat sex like an idol, so I break the sixth commandment. Or um, I, um, you know, I, I dishonor my teachers and my parents and others. And, and so I violate the fourth commandment. I will not be told what to do. I love myself and my opinions and I'm too prideful. You know, on and on, these 10 witnesses in a way, and the Lord calls them and says, you know, let, witness with me. What, what, there are other suitors in this person's life who in some way breaks through to one of those 10 commandments. It's just, it's just an idea. I'm not trying to say that's exactly what it means. But you, you can sort of sit here with a reading like this and you look around at the details. So Boaz calls this, he sits down, which by the way means that this is going to be a judicial process. Um, he calls the 10 witnesses, okay? Um, and they um, will witness these proceedings, but also sort of witness against us in a way that there are some obstacles that need to be cleared before we can be truly redeemed and fully saved by the Lord. And, um, and, and so, you know, you just kind of look around the scene a little bit. And what are the gates? They're the gates of our heart. Before I, behold, I stand at the door and I knock, says the Lord, right? He doesn't barge in. He knocks. And when we open, he will come in and have supper with us, which is a sign of intimacy. But until we open, see? So he goes outside the gates. He pushes back the competitors, so to speak, and he continues to knock and, and, and seeks entrance into our heart. So there's a picture here uh, that you can kind of see in, in, a, in a passage like this, okay? Now, before I go on, any comments or questions about these verses so far? All right, hearing none, I will move on. Verse seven, okay? <clears throat> 
Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. Uh, this was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the near kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. In other words, the property and, and the beautiful woman who goes with it, right? And he removed his sandal. And then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Mehalon. And I have also then, then acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Mehalon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead man, the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today, you are witnesses. And then the elders and all those uh, who were at the gate said, we are witnesses. Now, this word acquired uh, may bother us a bit. Um, I have acquired the property and also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, right? This may bother us today. Um, we don't acquire a wife, you know, but... But you think about it, you know, remember, Boaz is a picture of Christ. He does acquire us. St. Paul says, you are not your own. You have been purchased and at a price. In other words, the price of Christ's blood. So therefore glorify God in your body. Christ paid the price of our redemption, right? He acquired us for his own. He paid dearly for it, all right? So although that may not sound good of a man with his wife, it certainly makes sense with Christ, Yes that he had to acquire us, but it, he didn't acquire us with some sum of money or gold, but with his own blood, his own life. He gave his whole life. Now think about this, especially you women, but men too, listen up. What are you really doing at the altar? You're laying down your life for your bride, if you're, if you're a groom, you're laying, you're laying down your life. You're saying, I give you my entire life uh, in return for you. You see, I, I lay it down. I pay the price, so to speak. And a woman also, she lays down her life for her husband. Um, there's a, a handing over, if you will, um, of our lives to one another. And so there's this beautiful you know, reciprocity. But when it comes to Christ in the church, it's Christ who has to do all the work, right? Because we were dead in our sins, all right? So don't, never forget that we have been purchased and at an incredible price, the price of Christ's blood shed for us. Okay, are you praying with me? All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about a few of the other details here, the thing about the sandal and different things like that. So, um, first of all, <laughs> the image of the shoe is kind of odd here, isn't it? Um, but let's put it this way. What does Christ do? Well, one way of describing it is that he stands in our shoes. <laughs> you, you know, you've ever heard that expression, you know, a try, you know, walk in my shoes for a little while, you know, I mean, try on my shoes. So Christ... <laughs> You know, in taking this sandal, which is, it's kind of like, okay, can I have two? <laughs> You're going to give me one. But anyway, you get the idea. But Boaz, namely Christ, stands in our shoes. He buys back the land. Uh, and then, in other words, what we've lost. Um, but most importantly, he brings back Ruth. Ruth will now become his wife and inherit a whole new life. Adam's race will not die forever. The children of Adam now become the children of God and live forever with, with what Christ does for us. So, you know, if you will, Christ stands in our shoes uh, and walks with us, you see. Now, this other idea, um, he buys back the land and then also Ruth herself. Now, look, you're, you, some of you know this gospel song by uh, Hezekiah Walker, um, Faithful, Faithful is Our God. I'm reaping the harvest God promised me. Take back what the devil stole from me. And I rejoice today, for I shall recover it all. Through Christ, he take, he, we don't just recover ourselves. We recover the beauty of our good deeds. We require, you know, the, the things that he gave us that are ours. Um, we, if you will, we shall recover it all, okay? Some of us have had our dignity stripped from us. Some of us have been hurt and harmed. Some of us have been um, scorned and mocked and derided. Some of us have been unjustly deprived of wages or what belonged to us. And Christ says, you will recover it all. I will pay the price. So, you, you know, it's, it's a combination of he buys, Boaz buys the land, 
but also he and recovers it for the family. And therefore he also though acquires Ruth uh, so that she can live and flourish as his wife. Okay. So uh, start to see you know, some of the, the beautiful symbolism that goes on here. So what Christ has done for us is summarized very well in Ephesians chapter two, this idea of redemption. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm reading from Ephesians two and about verse 12. Don't need to flip to it, but at that time, at one time, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Is that not Ruth's condition, right? She's not, a, she's not an Israelite. She's a Moabitess, right? So Ruth is us, the church. And again, I'll start again. You were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, and having no hope. And you were without God in the world. But now, Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were, who at one time were far off, are now made near through the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. And he has made us both one and broken down the wall, the partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the hatred, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make himself of, uh, of the two of, two of us now one new person, one new man, and so making for peace. So Christ has, if you will, acquired us and made us both Jews and Gentiles one together. Um, so Ruth, who was not a Jew, but a Moabitess, a Gentile, is now joined by, through Boaz and what he has done to Israel. Christ takes J Jews, yes, whoever will come to him, but also Gentiles, and he makes of us one family. And so you see how Boaz is already, there's a symbolizing of what Christ does here. All throughout this book, Boaz has been, has been the... Um, um, you know, it has been just, you know, symbolizing so well what Christ does. Okay. So um, any comments on that? Because I, I, I can see you're, some of you are tired and we'll, we'll, we'll get through this here in just a few minutes. Okay. So um, we've seen two things so far, two pictures of salvation. First of all, we've seen again that there is a redeeming Lord, right? Secondly, there is now um, a renewal, a renewed life. That is to say, Ruth enters into this new life with Israel and acquires back what she was about to lose, namely the land, and also uh, having had and having no husband. Now she has a husband, a far better husband, and she has received back all that she would have lost. Okay, so there's a renewed life that she receives, and finally, then a restored legacy. A restored legacy. So I'm in verse nine um, right now. And um, so I'm going to pick up. <clears throat> then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have brought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Mehalon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Mehalon's widow as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from among the town records. Today you are witnesses, and the elders and all those at the gate said, yes, we are witnesses. May the Lord, now here, this is the, where we get into the new material. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing at Ephrathah may, uh, and be famous at Bethlehem. Through the offspring uh, that the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be the Lord, who this day has not left you uh, without, without a kinsman redeemer. Um, the, the women said this to Naomi. Uh, may, he now, uh, may he now become famous, this child, may he become famous throughout Israel. Uh, may God renew your life and sustain you now in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has now given birth to a new son. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. And th this then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. 
Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Uh, Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Saman. Saman, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Okay. So you see here that Ruth um, has now, if you will, um, not only do we have a redeeming Lord and a renewed life, but she now has a restored legacy of not just she, but also Naomi. So what, 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 is, uh, what, what has been received here? Family, fortune, and fame. So family, um, um, I, have, I have now, it says Boaz acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Mahalon's widow, as my life, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead so that his name may not disappear. So Ruth now enters into the family of Israel. Naomi's family is spared and they, 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 they remain. Um, and um, we see again uh, how Christ also joins us to the family of believers, to the family of the church. We become members of his body and we're brothers and sisters and we have one father in heaven. And so this is what Christ does to us. He, he, he doesn't just save us from our sins and say, now be good now and leave us alone. He joins us to a family, see? Secondly, uh, Naomi, as well as Ruth, receive a fortune. Um, so again, I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Mahalon in order to maintain the property. So again, we receive back, as I said, that old gospel song, I'm taking back what the devil stole from me. I, and I, I rejoice today, for I will recover it all. Look, if the devil's taken anything from you, I'm not just talking about material things, but if he's if, if he's allowed anyone, if 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 he if he's caused anyone, the devil, to, to, to destroy your dignity or your reputation or 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 some or your hope or or or, or just any number of things that the devil could take from you, the Lord wants to restore you many fold. All right. I see everything, says the Lord, and I know what some people have done to you. And I promise you, you will recover it all. You will recover it all. So we also then see that they receive fame. And again, I, I don't want to read the whole thing again, but the, the bottom line is that um, um, there is this magnificent um, fact that Ruth isn't just anybody in, in Israel or a story about some obscure woman. This is the grandmother of King David. <laughs> so, and that's pretty important, you know? And she wasn't even a Jew. She was a Moabitess, you know? So. Whatever your origins, whatever your struggles, whatever you, wherever you've been, whatever your losses have been, God can restore you and put you in a place where fruitfulness comes from you that you could never have imagined, right? Never have imagined. There was a time in my life in my mid-30s when I thought my life was over. I, I felt I'd, I'd failed in an assignment. I, I, I was named to be a pastor of a very difficult parish, and I, I couldn't do it. I had a nervous breakdown. I mean, it was impossible. There was no money. Uh, there, there were bills, cutoff notices. I just didn't know what to do. And I, 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 I had a nervous breakdown. I was hospitalized. And um, um, I thought, well, that's it. I'll never be a pastor. They're never going to trust me again. And, and um, you know, and, you know, now look at me. They even named me a Monsignor later, you know. <laughs> that may not impress you, but <laughs> it surprised me. I can tell you. And I've, I've been a pastor of several parishes now since. And yes, my life was restored and then some. And I've had a very, and in fact, that that whole nervous breakdown kind of broke my heart in a good sense. And I think it's made me a better man and more compassionate priest and it brought benefits. So is that I, called being human? Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Right. And then finally, again, there's this great fruitfulness. And again, we see that um, that that comes to uh Ruth and Naomi through, uh, through the family. Uh, the, 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 she bears a son, but of course she had, they had more children than just that. But the point is that um, this, this particular son, um, Obed bears, uh, you know, is, it, it has a very important and significant role uh, in Israel and being the, and being the, fa the uh, grandfather of David. Okay, so, all right. Uh, comments or questions? It's just funny that the book of Ruth doesn't get a whole lot of. Yeah. I think there should be a wonderful movie made by it. So why don't you, uh, you all call up people, you know, in Hollywood and tell them to make a movie. Maybe there is. I've, I've never seen a movie on the book of Ruth, but it's a magnificent story and it would make a good movie. So 
But some of you who are better at finding that stuff, maybe you'll find there is a movie out there. Let me know if you find it. We'll see if it's any good. But if not, maybe that should be Mel Gibson's next project. You know, after the, he's to, apparently going to be doing something on the resurrection, right? <laughs> Poor Mel. <laughs> he's a little, he's a little mixed up. You got to pray for him. But um, okay. Well, I think it's a beautiful book, and um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed, you know, presenting it. Uh, it's a beautiful story. It's about love. It's about faithfulness. Um, it's about romance. It's also uh, about the great romance that God has for us, um, the great love that he has for us. And um, um, at some point, it's much too long and detailed to go through now, maybe during Lent, though, we could look at the Song of Songs, which kind of has a similar theme. Okay, uh, not, It's not a story so much it is, but it's, it's more of a thematic a description of the of the love that God has for his people. Now, what I went, what I want to suggest to you is two possibilities. One next week, of course, on Friday is Christmas. We could just take next Monday off, or if you'd like to gather, there might be just a few um, aspects of the Christmas story. I, I often get a lot of questions in my question and answer column about some of the oddities of the Christmas story. And if you'd like, we could spend maybe just a little time looking at some of those, some of those questions and answers. Like, for example, one account, Luke's account and, and Matthew's account seem rather different. It seems like in, in Matthew's account, um, they return directly to Nazareth, whereas Luke has them fleeing to Egypt. Well, which is it? How do we reconcile all that? Um, we see, uh, we, so we see some apparent, I say apparent, discrepancies in the accounts and we wonder well how do we work them out um we we wonder a little bit about the time frame and different aspects of it um that, that are also uh given to us so if you're interested we could um you know why don't we just unless do you, do you think how many of you might be interested in just gathering next monday online because you might be traveling already right i see okay well all right well, let's give it a we'll give it a go and it uh, might just be a few of us, but um, it's, just, it's, it's some really interesting things that go on in the nativity story that she had never saw that there before. So we'll look into some of those and some of the apparent discrepancies. They're not real discrepancies, but apparent, okay? So we'll look at that, all right. Well, good, let's uh, finish with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and under the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, um, this beautiful story of Ruth reminds us of uh, of your son Jesus and his love for his bride, the church. Um, the um, bachelor of Bethlehem met the maid from Moab and um, um, they, they married and um, they did a, a great work in Israel and bringing forth ultimately the great King David. Um, so we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful story of love and help us then to be also aware of your great love for us. And we make all these prayers, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. All right. Okay, very good then. And um, I'll get the recording up and uh, that, that way all four recordings of Ruth will be available to you if you're interested in either listening to them or sharing them with somebody else. Okay, good. Monsignor, do we want to do another survey for the next book? Yeah. Um, or yeah. does anyone have any thoughts with that? I will tell you, let's see here. Um, Angelica Tom, are you still there Angelica? Or have you fallen asleep? I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good. Um, I'm doing a bit of lobbying for the next Bible study. Um, it says here, um, Ruth was so fruitful, by the way. Um, and then you, you go on to indicate you might like to study the letter to the Ephesians. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great letter also. I really like the letter to the Ephesians. Okay. Okay, well, we'll aim for that. But for next week, we'll just do a one-week little module because that'll uh, we don't want to start something the week right the day, a couple days before Christmas. So we'll do the Christmas stuff, and then uh, we'll start up at, at the new year with uh, Ephesians. Very good. And let's pray for this vaccine to begin to get out there and do what it needs to do so we can get out from our cocoons and from behind our mask. Amen, amen. <laughs> All right. God bless you all now. All right. Thank, thank you. 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 Th